Well, good evening, folks. How are you doing today? Good to see people from St. Francis of Assisi in Bakersfield. So we're on the Gospel of Luke, most especially on the parabolic narratives or discourses. Uh, we have covered quite a few uh, yesterday and this morning. Uh, what I want to cover this evening is uh, there's going to be a slight divergence. I want to cover certain metaphorical narratives that are found in all three Gospels. Uh, the fact that they are found in all three Gospels would, ind would indicate in the early apostolic community, this type of metaphor, this type of uh, narrative was extremely important. So it was covered in all three Gospels, and I figured I better cover it also. So uh, also, I will be covering uh, certain uh, episodes in Luke's Gospel that are not necessarily of themselves parabolic, but are so indicative of the Lucan understanding of how God deals with the misfortunate. And so that's one of the uh, key uh, thematics found in the Lucan narrative. And so I will cover that also. Uh, <clears throat> this evening, um, we'll start with Luke chapter 13, uh, 10 to 17, the healing of the woman who is crippled. Now, there's no parabolic discourse here, but there is a reference later on in Luke's gospel with the man with dropsy, and that's in Luke chapter 14. And so why are these two narratives with, contained within the same gospel? Because obviously they're going to deal with healing and Jesus's response to the elders of Israel and how he understands the role of God's healing manifestation and hand in human affairs even if it contradicts at that time the classical um, halak understanding shall we apply the torah narrative in this way using this perspective or do we cancel out the um, formal injunction of not to do something on the sabbath and carry it out anyway and so there's 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 a certain uh, tenaciousness. It's difficult sometimes uh, uh, for the uh, Torah teachers to understand Jesus, most especially when Jesus knows very well that what he's going to do is contradict the pastoral assessment of what should be done in a certain particular case. He's going to give a certain halak rendering, halakha. Part of the old uh, the oral Torah. How do you apply? How do you take this or that mitzvah? There's 613 mitzvahs contained within the five books of the Torah, and how do you apply them in this particular existential type of situation? That's halakha. Make a moral rendering. Make a moral make a moral determination of application. Is 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 this a case strong enough to desecrate Sabbath? That's going to be the issue. And of course, Luke's gospel is for the unfortunate. So he's not writing to, for the Jews. He's writing for Gentiles who have converted to the gospel message. Let's get to the text itself. Luke chapter 13, 10 to 17. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then, there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, woman, you are set free from your ailment. And when he laid hands upon her, immediately she stood up straight and began to praise God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept on saying to the crowd, look, there are six days in which work can, ought to be done. Come on those days to be cured, but not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said in reply, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger? and lead it and uh, away and give it water to drink? 
Ought not this woman, who is a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all of his opponents were put to shame and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. Let's take part, let's take apart that narrative because it's gonna come again in the next chapter. Okay, Sabbath law folks, and those who've had me before already know this, but those who do not, this is new for you. The Sabbath is God's bride. The Sabbath, God, when you read the Torah, Genesis narrative, God creates the world in six days. He rests on the seventh day. We are made in the image and likeness of God. We, we have the salam, the image embossed upon us. Whatever God is, is on us. We are made in his image and likeness. Image means whatever he is, we come from him. And whatever he is, is in fact in us. That's image. That's the salam. That's the stamp. Okay. Then there's likeness, image and likeness. God is free. God is merciful. And he's given us the gift of freedom and mercy. So we are like God in terms of a functionality. So the salam or image is structural. Likeness is functional. God asks us to be merciful and just. And if we are merciful and just, we are like God, image and likeness. And the greatest freedom, the, uh, the uh, greatest gift that God gave us was freedom. Uh, and it's not illusory, it's real. And we are held accountable for it. Okay. And in that freedom and in the understanding of honoring the Sabbath, by the way, if you break Sabbath law, uh, it's tantamount to apostasy. You are a Jew by how you act, not necessarily but what you believe, but how you act. If you are a law-abiding, Torah-observant Jew filled with faith and filled with the veracity that comes through Torah, and you adhere to Torah by the election of your freedom, because you choose to do it, you are Torah observant. And so you are a Jew, not so much by, by some sort of philosophical or theological, um, rhetorical understanding of things. You know, uh, it, being a Jew wasn't theoretical. It was highly pragmatic. You're a Jew because you act like a Jew. And how you act like a Jew? By being Torah observant. The Sabbath was sacred. God rests. He asked us to rest. Therefore, we rest. Period. You could desecrate Sabbath law for the, lake of, for, for the sake of life and limb. That you can do. There was always dispensations given. Okay. Here, at least in the gospel narratives, uh, dispensations are few and far between. In extra biblical documentation, uh, writings and readings outside of, outside of sacred scripture during the time period, there are other readings that would give the indication that Torah teachers were far more lenient than what we read in the gospel narrative. So you have to weigh that, okay? But the point is, you don't apostatize from Judaism by not keeping the Sabbath. You apostatize. You, you are supposed to be a real observant Jew. And when you are non observant, then you are not a Jew. This is not some sort of uh, theoretical undertaking. It is a concrete, pragmatic understanding of how we view human existence and our relationship to this God that brought us into being. Plain and simple. Okay. You could desecrate the Sabbath for sake of life and limb. In terms of halakha, giving a moral rendering of an interpretation of how you make applicable Torah, there's no medicine here. It's a straight out healing. Now the problem is going to be Jesus, the the synagogue leader was correct. 
wait a minute. Come on, those six, there are six days on which you can cure. Come on those days to be cured. Don't come on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is sacred. You're not supposed to do any work. There were 49 types of work that you could not do. You cannot, you could not transform, produce, or create. Those, those were the three headings. You shall not transform anything. You shall not produce, like harvest or whatever, and you shall not create from nothing something. Okay? Well, Jesus is transforming. You can't do that. Unless there's a grave reason. And this is where we get into the problem of interpretation. Halak interpretation. Is it, it, was Jesus justified in curing on the Sabbath? Now, in the Jewish mind, God does not listen to sinners. Okay. So, uh, it's like John 9 with a man born blind. If Jesus was not of God, he could not heal. Well, exact same thing in Luke's gospel. Only God heals. Only God cures. So if Jesus is a sinner and uh, non-observant of Torah, then how could he heal? That is the theological conundrum. That's the problem. So this is how it's handled. Woman, you are set free from your ailment. Notice there is no indication or proclamation of faith. There is no petitioning of the Father, give me the power to heal or to transform or to recreate. Again, uh, God is finished creating. That's why he's resting on the Sabbath. Well, not here he isn't. He's working on the Sabbath. He's in the act of recreating. See, that's the problem. See, that is the, that's the theological nuancing that has to be understood here. God is not resting on the Sabbath because Jesus isn't resting on the Sabbath. And if Jesus isn't resting on the Sabbath, neither is the Father. Because in the gospel narratives, the Father and I are one. So he's not resting He's working, he's recreating, he's transforming, he's transforming creation. He's transforming a uh, world that's, that's going to rise. And that's the problem. Yes, Jesus could have simply cured in on another day. Come back on another day and do your curing, Jesus of Nazareth. You Galilean rabbi. Why do you have to disregard halakha? Why do you have to disregard the precepts of the Torah? Well, he will answer that. Woman, you are set free from your ailment. Great line. The, the term woman, that's the designation that God gives to half of humanity in Genesis. He's recreating creation. He calls her woman. In John's gospel, Mary is called woman. In John's gospel, the woman caught in adulterous affair is called woman. In Luke's gospel, the woman who's, who anoints the feet of Jesus and kisses them with uh, uh, his feet and hair and washes his feet with her tears is called woman. Eve in Genesis is called woman. It's a sign of absolute dignity and respect given to half of humanity. So he calls her from, from the very foundation of her existence in Genesis. Woman, you are healed of your infirmity, you, you are healed of your infirmity or of your ailment. And he lays hands upon her. He touches her. Okay. And she stood up straight and began to praise God. Because she, she knew that only God heals. Okay. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, he disagreed with Jesus' halak application of the oral and written Torah. 
This is a theological issue. And obviously the, uh, the um, leader of, of the synagogue is really upset. You know, wait a minute. Uh, you should not have desecrated the Sabbath. You, you desecrate the Sabbath for, late, for the sake of life and limb. This is not life and limb. So Jesus, where do you get your authority? Well, he just did something that only God does in the Old Testament. He personally heals by his own uh, dynamis, his own power. Okay. But Jesus said to him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath, do you not work on the Sabbath? You do work on the Sabbath, don't you? Well, don't you untie your ox or your donkey from the manger and lead it away to, to give it food and drink? Don't you do that? Isn't that a work? Aren't you producing nourishment for your beast of burden? You're producing work for uh, food items for your animals to eat. Isn't this crippled woman more valuable than a beast of burden? And then he says, ought not this woman, and notice the line, a daughter of Abraham. Father, Abraham is the father of faith. For the Israelites. And this woman is a woman of faith. She's, Jesus calls her a daughter of Abraham. She has faith. But unfortunately, whom Satan bound for 18 long years. So for whatever reason, Satan had control over this woman's uh, physicality. For 18 years. That's a whole generation. And Jesus says, wait, wait a minute. Shouldn't it be right to be set free from the bondage on the Sabbath day? Jesus is the ultimate liberator of evil. He has control over Satan. He has control over the Sabbath. He has control over the, the physicality of someone's health. He's the master. He supersedes Torah. He supersedes the Sabbath. And he has jurisdiction over Satan. And he has jurisdiction over the natural physicality processes that keeps us alive and healthy. He has complete control over everything. And the people see it. Wait, only God cures. Now, you synagogue leader, leader you, you might have an issue here. But what we see here is this woman is cured. Jesus liberates her from the power of Satan. Jesus is, Jesus is the ultimate liberator of sin and the power of darkness, which is the power of Satan. He, he has jurisdiction over and he can cast him out, which he does by the laying on of hands, jurisdiction. And the people are amazed. So at that point, uh, okay, uh, how do you deal with this? These are the things that got Jesus into a lot of trouble. The next line is the parable of yeast, which I might add is found in uh, Matthew 13, Mark 4, and now Luke 13. Right, right after that, that healing experience, Jesus then, then gives this articulation about the kingdom of God. Remember, the kingdom of God is... The activity of God, how God is present is how he acts and how he's present and how he acts is how he's present. That's the kingdom of God. Okay. He therefore said, what is the kingdom of God like? Isn't it about restoration no matter what day it is? No matter what time of year it is? Isn't it, isn't it about restoration? And he said, therefore, this is Luke 13, 18 to 21. What is the kingdom of God like? So it's a metaphor. And what should I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed that someone took and sown in the garden. It grew and became a tree. And the birds of the air made their nest in its branches. And again, he said, to what should I compare to the kingdom of God? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of flour 
until it was all leavened. The kingdom of God, the activity of God, the presence of God, once it's in its seminal form, grows magnificently. It produces growth. It transforms. It produces. It's a new creation. It's new understanding of how you are present in the presence of God. Okay. That's what God is like. Even in the smallest minuscule of reality or grace or the activity of the spirit, no matter how small it is, it can produce great abundance in power and in authenticity. The kingdom of God, the presence of God, the action of God, once it grabs hold of you, you become a new creation. You are recreated. That which is your weakness can be your strength. That's what God can do. Your weakness can be your strength. And if you don't have the, the eyes of faith to understand that, but have natural life and you can only see weakness, then that's what you have. But if you have eyes of faith by which you, you can perceive that even in my fallen nature, evil, even in my sinfulness, even in my weakness, God is God. And he can do marvelous things even when I am weak. Because when I am weak, Paul says, God is strong. Well, this type of mentality gets Jesus into trouble big time. Uh, in the views of Torah teachers, he is desecrating the Sabbath unnecessarily. His interpretation of Torah and application of Torah differs from us. He's a threat to our legitimizing authority. We got to do something about this guy and sooner the better. So we have Luke chapter 13, 31 to 33. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, you go tell that fox, listen, I'm casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will finish my work. He's talking about resurrection. It's the third day. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside Jerusalem. Yeah, there's a certain predetermination in the plan, in the mind, and in the activity of God in Christ. He's going to end up like a prophet. Which prophet did, the, did Israel not persecute? Which prophet did they not kill? So there is that scene in Luke chapter 13, 34 to 35, the lament over Jerusalem. As I said earlier in another uh, Zoom cast, uh, 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 the inability to understand how God is visitating you, being a part of your life, if you're unable to see that, there are, re there are definite repercussions. And for Israel, not to recognize the time of their visitation, the time that they've prayed for, may the Messiah come, give us the Goel, the vindicator of God, to set us free from the Roman Imperium and from those things that hamper our lives as genuine, authentic Israelites. Help Israel to be the nation among nations because of the giving of the Torah we have that wisdom, that understanding, that gift that comes from God. And we have something to offer the world. And we're under jurisdiction. We, 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 are, we, under, we are under the uh, Roman Imperium. 
We are a vassal state of the Roman Empire. The Gentiles have occupied our land. We want to be freed from this desecration. So we pray for the Messiah. Messiah, come. And what happens when he comes? They're not ready to entertain his visitation, his ability to heal, to redeem, to deliver, to instruct. They will not listen. Herod's out to get you, Jesus. Run away. You go tell that fox. I will be here today, tomorrow, and for all time. I'm not finished yet. You go tell him. I'm casting out the evil one. I am in the process of destroying his kingdom. Your kingdom will be answerable later on. So he's standing right outside all of that, and he's looking at Jerusalem. This is found in Matthew 23, but also most especially in Luke chapter 13, 34 to 35. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets, the stones, those who are sent to it. How often have I desire to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will see me, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then there are later Lucan predictions. Not one stone will be left upon another. There is the effect of your disbelief. The effects of disbelief is desecration of the temple and the complete eradication of the theocracy of Israel. It happened before in the Babylonian captivity. When you disregard the activity of God, the presence of God, the prophets of God, the words of God, and, and, and follow something else, God allows that. But the effects of your disobedience has to run its course. It's a medicinal understanding. He's not being punitive for the sake of being punitive. It's punitive for the sake. It's a medicine. It's hard to swallow, but ultimately uh, it's to make you better. So even the effects of your disobedience can aid you in your, in your acceptance later on of the veracity of what the of what the prophets were trying to say okay now in luke 14 chapter 14 verses 1 through 8 the healing with the man with the dropsy so you have the woman on the sabbath bent over crippled over under the bondage of fainting for 18 years now there is a parallel narrative in luke that deals with man with dropsy. Okay. Luke 14, one through six. This is an interesting narrative. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leading Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath. So he's been invited by a well-known Pharisee. You know, and, and I might add something. Um, the Pharisaical tenets of belief did not disagree with the teaching of Jesus. Jesus is seen as a Pharisee, by the way, not as a Sadducee. Okay, Pharisees believed in the following. They believed in the, the divine origination of the written and oral Torah. It was not of human institution, but of divine institution, the Torah, the double Torah, written and oral Torah, divine institution. 
Pharisees believed that when you live a life of justice and mercy, you will have life everlasting. They believed in the immortality of the soul. They believed in bodily resurrection. They believed in angels, spirits, and demons. They believed in divine providence. They believed in angels. There is nothing contained within that foundational belief system, uh, 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 which was associated with the Pharisees that Jesus disagreed with. Uh, there was no contradiction of any of those points. The issue was the interpretation of those points. How do you interpret oral and written Torah? What is meant by bodily resurrection? What is meant by the immortality of the soul? Uh, what is the activity of angels, spirits, and demons? And what is God's providence as opposed to God's fate? Okay. Sadducees were very different. Sadducees were members of the Jewish uh, priestly class. They ran the temple concession. Uh, many of them were priests or Levites, and you were priests and Levites by heredity, by what tribe you belong to, okay? Sadducees did not believe in the oral Torah. They only believed in the written Torah. They did not believe in the immortality of the soul. They did not believe in bodily resurrection. They did not believe in angel spirits or demons. And they did not believe in providence. They simply believed in faith. Whatever happens, happens. And that's the way it is. You say, is this the same Judaism? Yes, it is. It's heterodoxy. This I've talked about time and time again. So. Jesus is now going to a house. He's a guest of a Pharisee to dine at dinner on the Sabbath. Now you got to say, what is the Pharisee up to? Tell me that. I mean, when I when I read the text, I have to ask, okay, what are you up to? Could you not invite him on another day? Why on the Sabbath? Well. You're going to find out. On one occasion, when Jesus was, was going to the house of a leading leader of the Pharisee party to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. No kidding. No kidding. Is this a setup? Just then, in front of him, gee, I wonder how this is going to going to occur. Just then, right in front of him, there was a man who had dropsy. That, that means there was uh, swelling in his limbs. And Jesus asked the lawyers and the Pharisees, so the Torah teachers and the scribes and the lawyers that knew Torah, okay? He's asking a hala question. How do you apply Sabbath law and the, the ability to heal in this particular situation? That's the issue. So Jesus asked the lawyers and the Pharisees, is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? A classic hala question. Can you desecrate Sabbath for the sake of life and limb. Well, this man has dropsy, okay? Is, is this a life and limb situation? It certainly isn't medicinal because there is no medicine being involved, okay? So you're not taking leaves or, or uh, 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 shrubs or uh, items that are naturally medicinal herbs and whatever grinding them up to make a poultice and then and then make a some suitable application no there's no medicine involved whatsoever so you're not producing anything and you're not creating however you are transforming that's the problem okay 
is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? So he's asking a real rabbinical question. But they were silent. Okay. They're not going to open their mouth. They are simply not going to do that. Okay. So Jesus took him and healed him and sent him away. Then he said to them, if one of you has a child or an ox that's fallen into the well, will you not immediately pull it out on the Sabbath day? And they could not reply to this. <clears throat> They're keeping the cards close to their chest. See, this is similar to the woman with the ailment. Uh, so here's this famous rabbi Jesus from Galilee, Nazareth. And he just healed someone at the dinner table on Sabbath. And he's trying to teach the elders of Israel, the Torah teachers, something about the kingdom of God. <laughs> how God is, is how he acts. How he is, is how he acts. So he's curing. He's not, he's not resting on the Sabbath. He's healing. And he is the Sabbath maker. The Sabbath came from God. And Jesus has jurisdiction over the Sabbath. Guess why? Guess how? Because he is what he claims to be. He's the word of God made flesh. He is his own law in human form. So it doesn't go well. Uh, now, in the other uh, uh, gospel traditions, this is done. The man with the dropsy. It, it takes place in the synagogue rather than at a dinner table. So there's a transformation of the actual literary form here. And then in Mark's gospel, the moment he cures him, uh, the Torah teachers gather with the Herodians and they say, we got to destroy Jesus. So Luke just takes that understanding of what's going to happen to Jesus. That's why when Jesus departs from Galilee, the Pharisees say, you better get out of here. Herod's out to get you. And I might add, the Pharisees are helping Herod to, to get Jesus. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult thing. I, I mean, there's, there's, what are you going to do with a rabbi and I might add, uh, there's no indication of sacred scripture that Jesus had any formal teaching or any formal training as a teacher. And he certainly didn't get delegation um, from the Sanhedrin, okay? So he's one of those uh, uh, wild cannons that just shoots off. He's one of those people that you cannot contain he certainly differs from us. He certainly didn't get delegation from us to preach and teach. Uh, we didn't know that he studied at this or that yeshiva or went to temple school or whatever. Uh, and so uh, the only thing that we know, he's from Galilee and he's a miracle worker. He's a wonder worker. And he teaches a new understanding of Torah, which disagrees with us. So what are we going to do with him? You know, I mean, what are we, you know, what are we going to do? And I'm sure the Sadducees were in the exact same situation. You know, if it's true for the Pharisees, like he's giving them a hard time, are are we next in line? And the answer is most assuredly, because. The Sadducees did not believe in the immortality of the soul, nor the oral Torah, nor in life everlasting, nor in body resurrection, which was a solid teaching of Jesus. So later on in the gospel narratives, 
uh, Jesus is going to have a very interesting relationship with them. And uh, they don't do well. So you have the two parties in Israeli culture. Actually, there's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, what we call the fourth philosophy or the Zealots. Yeah. And, and, and then the people from Herod. And they all had a certain understanding of how you make God's law applicable and, and how this should be done. So here's this Jesus that's contradicting what we hold to be true and valid. There are six days in which you can cure. Come on those days. Why do you have to cure on the Sabbath? And both cases were not life and limb. If it's a life and limb issue, you could desecrate Sabbath law. But that's not the case here. Jesus is showing jurisdiction over nature. He's showing jurisdiction over Sabbath. And with the woman, with the ailment, jurisdiction over Satan himself. And when he asks the Torah teachers and the scribes at the dinner held by the Pharisee, a, a classic halal question, is it proper to cure on the Sabbath? Tell me, tell me what you want to say. They're silent. So Jesus simply cures. Now does the silence equal consent? Well, in some circles, silence equals consent under law. Not necessarily here. So the point is, uh, Jesus is going to have to be very careful now in, in, in what he's going to say. And it's going to get worse, not better. He's going to be in direct confrontation with the elders of Israel. So stay tuned for that. Okay, we now open up for question and answer. Brian, go ahead, please. Thank you, Father. Um, yes, so as you said, uh, if you have a question, please just raise your hand or just type it in the chat box and uh, I'll choose on you. Or if you can indicate that you have a question, just please click the raise hand button. I see there are uh, no Riley, questions. Yes, you have a question? Uh, please just unmute yourself. Go ahead. It's not a question per se, a comment just to just to break the silence. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, let's see. I noticed three things that is different here. One of which the class is kind of short and no breaks. I noticed there's I don't get any lace chips. Let's see, and the last part is I noticed there's like R2 on my tablet. I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. I don't understand the question. No, I don't understand just what you're saying. Okay. Is there anyone else, please? Anyone else? Anyone else with the question or a comment per se? If not, I will close. Again, when you look at the uh, Luke and parables, we, we are trying to understand how is God acting by his presence. And his presence is through Jesus, plain and simple. Uh, Gospel of Luke makes it very clear. When Jesus acts, it's the activity of God for the sake of our well-being. He will even desecrate his own laws, Sabbath laws, for the sake of us. So that really means that we have a a great value and a great dignity contained within us that God has placed in us. And he honors that. 
And if there's something in our livelihood that's disconnected or not, or, or is not what it should be, he out of his love for us comes and makes all things new. He's in the act of recreating. That's one of the uh, issues whenever he gives a parabolic discourse. Think of yourself in the place of the narrative, whatever that narrative is. If you were that woman with the ailment, if you were the man with the dropsy, if you were a scribe, if you were a Pharisee, how do you respond to Jesus's call, Jesus's question? You know, is it, is it necessary? Is it good to cure on the Sabbath or not? You know, uh, put yourself in that position. How would you respond to the Lord Jesus Christ? How would you respond to that woman? How would you respond to that man that, that had the dropsy? Would you be glad that Jesus desecrated the Sabbath law and got into a very difficult relationship with the elders of Israel for the sake of those two people? What side would you be on? That's the purpose of the parable, to get you thinking. What would I say? What would I do? How would I handle myself if I was with Jesus in the synagogue, if I was with Jesus at the table dining with him, and he asked that question? Would I be pleased or unpleased? Would I side with the scribes and the Pharisees because they, they held a certain understanding of healing on the Sabbath? Or would I say, Jesus, somehow you have mastery over the Sabbath. You have mastery over Satan. You have mastery over the physicality of human existence. I may not understand why, why you are doing this, but one thing is clear, you're healing. You are, you are producing a transformation that recreates creation. Think about that. Where would you be in these parabolic discourses? What, what actor would you be? What would you think? What, what would you say to Jesus? Thank you for coming. We'll, we will see you in the next broadcast. Take yes. care. Thank you for coming, everyone. I posted the uh, information in the chat box. So just visit the websites and yeah, see you guys next time. Bye. Good night.